Red Brick Media. High quality CDs, DVDs, lectures, khutbah, conferences and Quran recitations. All revenue generated supports our dawah work, supported by visiting our store. You can now purchase directly from our site www.redbrickmedia.co.uk بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين I want you to go through a particular hadith today regarding those who will be from the glad tidings of paradise. And not only will they be from those who will enter paradise, but they will be uh, in particular seven of them will be from those who will be specially chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what will it be about these specific people, these seven people, that they will be chosen by Allah Azza wa Jal? The hadith that I want to mention today is the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, where he said that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu was salam, he said, Sab'atun, seven, yudilluhumu Allahu fi dhillih, Allah will place in his shade, yawma la dhilla illa dhilluh, a day when there is no shade except his shade. What day is this? What day is this? The day of judgment. Seven people who will be in the shade of Allah Azza wa Jal on the day that there will be no shade except his shade. And the first was Imamun Adil, a just ruler. So that's the first one. The second, Shabun Nasha'a fi ibadatillah, a young man who has been brought up worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third, رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ A man whose heart is attached to the masjid. He's always in the masjid. The fourth, رَجُلًا Two men, تَحَابَّا فِي اللَّهِ They love each other for the sake of Allah. اِجْتَمَعَ عَلَيْهِ They meet for the sake of Allah. وَتَفَرَّقَ عَلَيْهِ And they depart for the sake of Allah. And the fifth, Rajulun Da'atu Imra'a, a man who is called upon by a, who is called upon by a woman, a woman calls him Da'atu Imra'a Dhata Mansibin wa Jamal. A woman invites him and to fornicate with him or to fornicate with her, someone who has Dhata Mansib wa Jamal, someone who has status and she has beauty. فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ And this person, he says, I seek refuge in Allah, or I fear Allah. إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ And the sixth, رَجُلٌ تَصَدَّقْ A man who gives sadaqa فَأَخْفَاهَا And he hides what he gives, so much so that his left hand doesn't know what his right hand is given. And the seventh, the last one, رَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيًا A man who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thinks about Allah azza wa jal on his own, in isolation. فَفَاضَتْ عَيْنَاهُ And his eyes shed tears. He becomes, uh, يعني, he becomes emotional and he weeps because of him remembering Allah azza wa jal in isolation, on his own, when he's on his own. This hadith, it's narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu an. And you all know Abu Huraira. Radiallahu an, and he's stationed in, in Islam and amongst the companions. But what was his real name? What was the real name of Abu Huraira? As you all know, Abu Huraira is his laqab. It's something which was given to him, a nickname that he was given. And Huraira is a kitten. And they say that Abu Huraira radiallahu an, used to always have a kitten with him. And so he was known as Abu Huraira. And also he was known as Abu Hir or Abu Hir. As the Messenger of Allah sallallahu wa also called him this, as mentioned in the hadith. But his real name was Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhar al dawsi According to most of the scholars, there's a difference of opinion upon his, about his real name. But this is what some of the scholars, they say that his name was Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhar al dawsi And subhanAllah, you see many of the hadith that I mentioned. He is the one who narrates the hadith. And he is the one who has narrated most of the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu Over 5,000 hadith are narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. 
So he was a companion of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, during his time. And even when it comes to written form and the hadith are written and we see his name, he's a companion in the hadith them, in, in and of themselves. Whenever his name is there, he's, it's mentioned next to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, the majority of the time, over 5,000 times. And the hadith starts, and the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he said, Sab'atun yudilluhumullah. Seven, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them shade. Now the number seven here is mentioned, but does that mean that there will specifically only be seven people or will there be more people, other types of people? There are other narrations and other hadith which mention that there are more than seven. There are other types of people, there are other people who will be given this blessing on the Day of Judgment that they'll be in the shade of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this seven isn't necessarily uh, seven. It, it, there's more than seven people who will be in the shade of Allah Azza wa Jal. But rather it's there so that he, the people will learn and will relate to it and uh, learn it and it's a way, a method of teaching uh, some of the you know, some of the teaching methods of the Messenger of Allah that he would uh, quantify, he would enumerate things and he would mention a number so that people will it'd be easier for people to, to grasp and to understand. And he talks about seven in particular in this specific hadith. Sab'atun yudilluhumullah, seven that Allah Azza wa Jal will put under in, in, in his shade, yawma la dhilla illa dhillu. A day when there will be no shade except his shade. What will this shade be? Specifically, what is this shade going to be? When it says, yudilluhumullahu fi dhilli, he will put them in his, in his shade, yani in Allah Azza wa Jal's shade. We shouldn't understand from this that it's going to be the shade of Allah Azza wa Jal himself. Why shouldn't we understand this as the meaning of the hadith? That this should specifically be the shade of Allah Azza wa Jal. Who can tell me? Okay, it's light. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, if there's light, if there's a shadow from something, what does that mean? If something has shade, hey, that's right, khair. that the sun is above it, or there's something above that thing which has shade. So when we talk about dhil, when we talk about the shade of Allah Azza wa Jal, the scholars they say that when it comes to the shade, it's going to be something which Allah Azza wa Jal creates. So we shouldn't think of it as something uh, yani which is going to be Allah's shade himself, but it's something which Allah Azza wa Jal will create. He will create a shade on the Day of Judgment for these specific people. Sab'atun yudilluhum Allah, seven that Allah Azza wa Jal will shade, yawma la dhilla illa dhilluh. A day that there will be no shade except his shade. And who from amongst us will not want the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment? As is mentioned in the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that on this day, according to the person's deeds and his sins, he will, have, he will be sweating due to the closeness of the sun to him. It will be like a mile close. It will come to the, to the people a mile in, in, in distance. So the sun will be so close and the people will sweat on this day. Subhanallah. And so a person will sweat according to his deeds. And some will be up to their knees, some will be up to their hips, some will be up to their mouths. And in the narration, the Messenger of Allah, Messenger of Allah وسلم, himself put his hand towards his mouth. And so on this, on this, on this day, Yawmun Azim, this great day, who from amongst us wouldn't want to be from those who will have the shade of Allah Azza wa Jal and protect ourselves from, uh, from the deeds that we did in this life. سَبْعَةٌ يُضِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ظِلِّ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلُّ A day when there will be no shade except his shade. And the first that is mentioned in this, in this hadith is Imamun Adil, a just ruler, someone who is just, someone who rules over the people, and he is someone who is just. And in these uh, times we see many unjust rulers, and subhanAllah, it's something that they will be held to account for on the Day of Judgment. And also when it comes to being just, it's something that we can look at when it comes to those that we are responsible for. Responsible for. As Messenger of Allah وسلم, he said, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ You are all shepherds, and all of you will be responsible for your sheep, for your sheep on the Day of Judgment. You are all going to be asked about those people that you're responsible for, whether it was your children or those people under your employment, or whoever they were, you are going to be responsible and you are going to be asked about this on the Day of Judgment. 
And when it comes to, for example, those of us who have children, we have to be people who are adil, people who have adil, people who are just when it comes to our children. So you don't treat one child one way and treat the other child in another way, but rather you should be fair when it comes to your children and how you deal with them and how you behave towards them. And you show you know, kindness to all of them. The second that is mentioned after Imam Adil, after the just ruler, is Shabun Nasha'a fi ibadatillah. A young man who was brought up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A young man who is brought up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this man, when he's brought up, when he was young, he was brought up in the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. He wasn't someone who had distractions and somebody who was guided to the, the wrong things and the wrong ideas and the wrong activities. And unfortunately nowadays, especially living in the West, there are many distractions for the children when it comes to TV and internet and you know, computer games and all these things. And it's, it's upon the, the parents and upon the guardians to make sure that they educate their children and they look after their children and make sure that they are people who you know, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and are close to their religion and are reminded of their duties to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many times do we hear of uh, children or generally people when they talk about hajj, for example, and they say, I don't want to do hajj until I become older. I don't want to perform hajj until I'm 60 or 70 years old. SubhanAllah, what guarantee do you have that you're going to live that long? What guarantee do you have that you're going to live to, you know, live tomorrow, let alone 50 or 60 years down the line? So this mentality is something which starts when you're young. If a person was being educated Islamically when he was young, then he won't have this mindset when he's older. So it's important uh, to make sure that our children are guided in the right way, educate them in the right way, uh, bring them to gatherings, Islamic gatherings, uh, you know, give them the right company when it comes to their friends and those that they associate with, those that they accompany. As the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, that a person is on the religion of his friend. So look at who you become friends with. So it's important to see who the children, even ourselves, not just our children, but who we associate with, who we hang around with. You notice sometimes we associate with certain people and their character and their personality rubs off, rubs onto us. Things that they say, things that they might say that we never used to say, but because we're with them all the time and we hear them all the time, we start picking up certain words. And so we start using certain words in our vocabulary that we never used to use before. And so we think, you know, why am I saying these particular words now? What's the reason that I'm saying these words? And you realize because you were associating with certain people, you start saying certain things. But if you have good company, people who are, you know, people who are, uh, people who are practicing and people who are strong in the religion, people who are righteous people, and they say good things and they do their adhkar and they're always remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you'll pick up all these good things and all these good habits. So a person always needs to make sure about who he associates with and who he hangs around with. So this is the second person that is mentioned in the hadith. Shabun nasha'a fi ibadatillah. A person who is brought up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And many of the scholars of the past, we all know that they, when they were young, they were brought up worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and studying and learning their religion. The third that is mentioned in this hadith is Rajulun Qalbuhu Mu'allakun Bil Masajid. Rajulun, a person, Qalbuhu Mu'allakun Bil Masajid. A person whose heart is attached to the masjid. Somebody who always comes to the masjid. Somebody who, when he comes for the salah, for example, and he prays in the masjid, and when he leaves the masjid, his heart wants to go back to the masjid. <laughs> He can't wait for the next salah so he can go back and pray a second time or pray for the next prayer. And every time he comes to the masjid and he sits down and he remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he feels at ease. He feels his tranquility, he feels his peace inside of him when he's in the masjid and he's happy to be in the masjid. And it's unfortunate nowadays we see it seems to be the opposite. 
that a person when he's at home and the time for salah comes, he's you know he's not eager to go to the masjid. He's not happy to go to the masjid. He feels like he's forced to go to the masjid. And subhanAllah, I mentioned this in another place, in another talk that I did, when the time for salah comes and a person's at home, and it happens to all, to all of us, when a person becomes lazy and the time for salah comes, he becomes lazy and he doesn't feel like going to the masjid. And it's amazing how this specific type of laziness that a person feels when it comes to the salah, and going to the masjid is like no other type of laziness that a person has. When a person's tired, for example, and he wants to sleep, it's a different type of, of laziness and a different type of tiredness. When a person wakes up in the morning, for example, you know, the type of laziness that he feels at that time is different to the type of laziness that he feels when he goes to the masjid, subhanAllah, or when he has to go to the masjid. And so this is a sign that is from the, from the works of the shaitan. The shaitan is trying to deceive him and distract him and trying to prevent him from going to the masjid and benefiting himself when he goes to the masjid to perform to perform the uh, the prayer so this is one of the signs of those who will be under the sh- under the shade of allah one of those people that his heart will be attached to the masjid and he will always want to go to the masjid and it's important to realize that we need to make uh, a routine for ourselves a schedule for ourselves a timetable where we're cons- consistently going to the masjid because if we do something regularly enough it's going to be easy for us to, to get used to it. If a person goes to the masjid once a week, for example, for example, the Sunday talk, or this, for example, Sunday for Isha, and he only goes once a week, it's going to be difficult for him to get into a routine. Some Sundays he might come, some Sundays he might not come. He, he might come for one Sunday, and then six days he doesn't come. You know what? What guarantee does he have that he's not going to that he's going to make it for the next Sunday? After six days of not going to the masjid, it's difficult. But if someone's always going to the masjid every single every single day, seven days a week, and all of a sudden, for example, after two three weeks, he's been going to the masjid every single day, and then one day he doesn't go, he's going to feel this, and he's going to feel upset, and he's going to feel unhappy. Likewise, somebody who's always going to the salawat. Somebody who always goes to the masjid to pray five times a day. When he doesn't go to the masjid, when he misses the prayer, when he oversleeps or he forgets or whatever the reason, you know, he feels upset that he actually missed the salah. That he wasn't able, he wasn't given the opportunity to attend the salah in the masjid. And this comes down to a person being uh, regular and consistent in his actions. Likewise, when it comes to uh, the five daily prayers and praying them on time, even just praying them on time. When a person prays the five daily prayers, and not only does he pray the five daily prayers, but he prays the, the, the optional prayers, the sunnah prayers. And he never misses a sunnah prayer. He never misses a sunnah prayer. He's always praying the sunnah prayers after Isha and after Maghrib and all the other sunnah prayers that he has, all the other optional prayers he has, he never misses them. And the witr prayer he always prays. A person's always praying these sunnah prayers. When he always prays these sunnah prayers and the witr prayer every single day, what chance is there of him missing the, the fard prayer? What chance is there of him forgetting the fard prayer? Forgetting the obligatory prayer? So this is a way of, of making sure that we don't ever fall behind when it comes to our salawat, when it comes to our prayers. To make sure that we pray our sunnah prayers and never missing them, it's a way for us to make sure and to guarantee that we will never miss our, our obligatory prayers. Because you're so steadfast when it comes to the optional prayers, let alone the fard prayers, that when you miss the optional prayers, you're never going to miss the fard prayer. You know that the fard prayer is something which you can't miss. So this was the third uh, person that is mentioned in the hadith, who would be in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. The day when there's no shade except his shade. رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ A person whose heart is attached to the masjid. And also it's mentioned in the hadith that a person will be rewarded for every step that he takes to the masjid. Every step that he takes to the masjid, he will be rewarded for it. And he will be raised one rank for each step that he takes. And for each step, a sin will be erased and wiped out for him. So you can imagine the amount of blessing and the amount of uh, reward that there will be for a person like this. The fourth that is mentioned in the hadith 
is Rajulan two people, the Habalillah, they love each other for the sake of Allah. Ijtama Ali, they meet, they meet each other for the sake of Allah, Watafarraqa Ali. And they depart for his sake. So for example, you might have a friend and we all have people that we associate with and accompany. And sometimes we go out, you know, to eat, for example, with our friends, or we might go shopping with our friends, or maybe that's just the, the sisters who probably do that. And you, you might do other things with your friends, other activities that you might do, go out camping or whatever you may do. But those people that you associate with, those people that you might call when there is a talk going on or a conference going on or some seminar or some Islamic activity, something that's happening that's going to benefit you in this life and in the hereafter. When something like this is happening, you call your friend and you say to him, look, there's an activity happening, there's a, a talk happening, why don't we go and you know, check the talk out, listen and benefit ourselves? This person is the one who is going to be benefiting himself and his Muslim brother. And they love each other for the sake of Allah. So they love each other for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because whenever they meet, they are meeting for Allah Azza wa Jal's sake. Whether it's to go out and, and help the needy, for example, feed the poor, or to, to benefit themselves in a, in a lecture, whatever the reason may be. But they are going purely for, the, for His sake, purely for Allah Azza wa Jal's sake. And they love each other for His sake. And they only meet because they know that there's a benefit in it for them, in this life and in the hereafter. So there's, an, there's, a, there's a higher objective. It's not just to, for example, go out and enjoy themselves, but it's something which is going to benefit them in this life and in the hereafter. Rajulani tahaba fillah. Two people who love each other for his sake. Tahaba lillah ijtama'a alayh. Two people who love each other and they gather for this reason and they also depart for this reason. So once they gather and they go out and they do something for Allah Azza wa Jal's sake, whether it's you know, feeding the, the, the poor or there's a talk or there's a, there's a lecture going on, they come for the talk, they leave after they have done what they needed to do when it came to serving Allah Azza wa Jal and doing something for His sake. Rajunani tahaba fillah ijtama'a alayh They gather for this wa tafarraqa alayh The fifth that is mentioned in this Rajulun da'athu imra'a A man who is called upon by a woman ذات منصب وجمال A woman who has status She is someone who has status ذات منصب وجمال Someone who is has status and she is beautiful. And he says in reply, Inni akhafullah. Verily, I fear Allah Azza wa Jal. And so a woman calls a man, for example, that a mansib wa jamal, someone who, is, who has status and who has you know, uh, ranking in, the, in, in society, wa jamal, and on top of that, she is beautiful. And she calls a man to fornicate with her. And he says in reply, Inni akhafullah, verily I fear Allah Azza wa Jal. And he refuses. And you all know the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, the Prophet of Allah Azza wa Jal. When he was in the, the room with Imratu Aziz, the wife of Al Aziz, and it's mentioned in the Quran that this woman, that she closed all the doors. And the word that is used when it comes to closing the doors, غلقت, it's something which shows emphasis that she securely closed these doors. She made sure they were closed securely and tightly and there was nothing that was going to come out of that room and nothing was going to come in. And she was a woman of status, someone who you know, had, had mansab, someone who had a status in society. And when you're in the company of, of a woman like that, on top of this, that amongst even wa Jamal, someone who's also beautiful. You can imagine someone in a position, especially in the position of Yusuf alayhi salam, when he was in the company of someone who, whose husband was, was his master, and he was a slave, and he was in the, in, the, in the comfort of their home, and the room was secure, fully secure, nothing was, nothing was coming in, nothing was going out, nobody could see what was happening. 
and she was someone who had who had you know status in in society someone who had influence subhanallah it takes a lot of uh, courage a lot of strength for someone to you know stop themselves from committing zina and from fornicating and from remembering allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this situation and in fact it takes a lot less for us just to commit a sin for example when it comes to stealing for example or doing any other type of deed any other type of sin regardless of whether there was security in the room whether we were secure whether anybody else was watching sometimes we do other other sins which we might consider uh, less um, severe or not less severe but something which isn't as as uh, harder to do as f- fornicating with a woman in the in the security of her own home so we might we might have for example uh, something in a room which is considered valuable and we might be in a situation where we need the money and we know there's nobody there and nobody's watching and we can take this and we'll, we'll live off it and we're in need of this of this money and it's a lot easier for us to do this but look at Yusuf alayhi salam when he's in that situation when he's a slave and on top of this is the is is the wife of his master who's calling him and who's inviting him to, to fornicate with him to fornicate with her and on top of this he's reprimanded after after he you know refuses so subhanallah it takes a lot of courage and a lot of mental strength and a lot of uh, fear of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to refrain from doing this رجل دعته امرأة ذات منصب وجمال a man the fifth one a man who is called by a woman who has status and beauty فقال إني أخاف الله and he says I fear Allah سبحانه وتعالى the sixth person that is mentioned in this hadith from those who be in the shade of Allah عز وجل is رجل تصدق بصدقة a man who gives صدقة and not only does he give sadaqa, فَأَخْفَاهَا He hides it حَتَّى لَا تَعْلَمُ شِمَالُهُ Until his left hand doesn't know what his right hand gave. So a man who gives sadaqa, who gives in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, gives his wealth to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when it comes to, when it comes to giving wealth for Allah azza wa jal's sake, sometimes it's very difficult for us to give money. It's easy for us to take money and to receive money, but it's hard to give money. It's hard to give, to give money and to give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we become very greedy and very stingy when it comes to giving them money. You know, we receive so much money, we get so much money, we're too worried about our bank accounts and how much money we have and, you know, how much money we need. And then when it comes to giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it's just one pound, it's something which we start to worry about. And we start to, you know, feel uncomfortable giving money, even if it's a small amount. But where did this money come from in the first place? How was it that you came to receive this money in the first place? If it wasn't for the fact that Allah azza wa jal himself gave you the ability to wake up in the morning, and gave you the power to be able to leave the house and walk to work or drive to work and do the work that you do every single day and he gave you the ability to work with your hands and to be able to hear and to be able to speak if it wasn't for all this then you wouldn't have the money that you have now so don't think that all this that you did was all from your own self but rather it was from Allah Azza wa Jal and it was from his power لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله there is no power or might except with Allah, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all this wealth that we have, all this wealth that we get, it's as a result of Allah azza wa giving us the ability to be able to work for it. So who are we to deny giving something for the sake of Allah azza wa when he asks for it? And also giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a means of our wealth increasing. One of the ways that a person's wealth can increase is by giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also being grateful for what you have. Sometimes we're worried, we say, oh, we don't, I don't have a lot of money, 
I don't have enough money, so I don't want to give money. Because what I have isn't enough. I don't have enough money in order for me to give. But if a person is grateful for what he has, if he's grateful for the money that he has, even if it's a small amount, just the fact that he's grateful for what he has and he says, Alhamdulillah, I'm grateful for the money that I have, even if it's a little amount of money, a small amount of money, him just being grateful for what he has is a means of Allah Azza wa Jal increasing what he has. As Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, وَلَا إِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ And if you are grateful, then I will increase you. So if you're grateful for what you have when it comes to your wealth, and you're grateful for all the things that Allah Azza wa Jal has given you, then this in and of itself is a way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increasing your earnings. And this isn't just with wealth, for example. A person wants to memorize the Quran. He wants to memorize Juzi Amma, for example. And he only knows the first three surahs. Or he wants to memorize Surah Baqarah. And Surah Baqarah is over three juz. And he's only memorized two or three pages. And every time he looks at the Mus'haf and he looks at Surah Baqarah, and he sees all those pages and he looks at how much pages he's actually memorized and he's flicking through the rest and he's thinking, SubhanAllah, how am I going to memorize all this? How difficult is it going to be for me to memorize all these other pages? I've only memorized, surah, I've only memorized two pages. You know, but mountains are climbed with single steps. A person needs to pace himself and step by inshallah he'll get to his, to his goal. And he needs to be grateful for what he's already done. Alhamdulillah, he's given, Allah Azza wa Jalla has given him the ability to memorize those two pages, to memorize that one single page, to memorize that half page that he's memorized. Some people don't even get the chance to be able to memorize not even one page of the Quran or to be able to even read the Quran. And some people don't even get the ability to just read the Quran itself because of the eyesight. Maybe some people are blind. They don't even have the ability to read the Qur'an. So we should all be grateful for whatever we have. So if a person has memorized two pages of the Qur'an and he wants to memorize Surah Baqarah, and he's memorized two pages of Surah Baqarah, he needs to be grateful for what he's already memorized. And this is what the scholars used to say. They used to say first that a person, when he wants to memorize the Qur'an, he should be grateful for whatever he has already memorized. Don't worry about looking at the other 300 pages that you need to go through. Look at what you have memorized and be grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal that you memorize those pages. They say it took Ibn Umar radiallahu an, I think eight years to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah. Surah Al-Baqarah, eight years it took him to memorize it. Eight years to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah. And when the companions used to memorize surahs, it wasn't just a matter of just memorizing them without understanding them. They would memorize these surahs and they would act upon them and they would implement them. And this is why it took Ibn Umar radiallahu an so long to memorize. Because they would memorize a, per, a portion of the Qur'an, a portion of, of a surah, and they would act upon it, and they would benefit from it, and then they would move on. So one of the ways that a person can increase his wealth is by being grateful for what he already has. رَجْلٌ تَصَدَّقَ بِصَدَّقَ فَأَخْفَاهَا So this person who is under the shade of Allah Azza wa Jal, on the Day of Judgment, he gives in the way of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala فَأَخْفَاهَا And he hides it. فَأَخْفَاهَا حَتَّى لَا تَعْلَمُ شِمَالُهُ He hides it until his left hand doesn't know what his right hand is giving. So when he starts giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he hides it from the people. The people don't know what he's giving or if he's even giving at all. And this is from sincerity and it's from the ikhlas of a person that when he gives in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he hides what he's giving. Because there's no chance of him showing off when it comes to what he is giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person when he gives in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he should hide what he gives in the way of Allah azza wa jal as a means of his, of his act being accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he shows a person's sincerity and a person's ikhlas when he does this. رَجْلٌ تَصَدَّقَ بِصَدَقَ A person who gives صَدَقَ فَأَخْفَاهَا And he hides it حَتَّى لَا تَعَلَمُ شِمَالُهُ Until his left hand So much so that his left hand doesn't know what his right hand gives. And that is the sixth person. And the last person who will be shaded on the Day of Judgment رَجْلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيًا A person who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
in isolation on his own. And as a result of this, he begins to weep because of him remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in isolation. And there can be many ways that a person can do this. One of them is reading the Quran itself. A person can read the Quran. And subhanAllah, it's amazing how sometimes we read the Quran and we don't know a single word of Arabic. And yet a person can get emotional. And he can start crying just by reading the Quran. And the, the, the power and the effect of the Quran is immense on the person. Whoever reads it with sincerity and with ikhlas, it can have a great impact on his heart. A person can start weeping while he's in the isolation of his own room, reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he will start crying just because of the power and the immense uh, effect that the Quran has on the person. And this is from the miracles of the book of, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You might get someone who is a big man, someone who never cries, someone who is emotionless, someone who you never see becoming emotional. He never cries. And maybe he's known for this. You might know someone who's known for not crying. He's someone who you never see crying. He might be cold-hearted. Somebody who you never see crying or showing any sign of emotion, subhanAllah. But then when he starts reading the Qur'an, he starts to cry. Or when he hears the Imam recite Qur'an, he begins to cry. Or somebody who is very big and muscular. And then when the Qur'an is read and when he reads the Qur'an, he starts to crumble. And he starts to weep and he starts to cry for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the strength and this is the power and the effect that the Qur'an has on the person who reads it with the khushu'. And it's important for us when we read the Qur'an to try to understand what we're reading. To try and think about what we're reading. When we read the Qur'an, try to have the Noble Qur'an uh, in front of us. And the translation of the Qur'an or transliteration of the Qur'an. And then we can see what we are reading, what we're reciting. But even when the Imam is reading, we all understand certain aspects of the Qur'an. Whether we realize this or we don't. For example, Surah Al-Fatiha. We all know the meaning of Surah Fatiha. We all know what Surah Fatiha means. But how many of us, when we hear Surah Fatiha being recited by the Imam, do we think about what is being recited? How many times do we actually think about those words that are coming out of the Imam's mouth? Those words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. All praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds. How many times when we hear this, this ayah, do we actually think about this, this ayah in and of itself? And the scholars, they say that one of the ways that we can have khushu' in the prayer, that we can have focus in the prayer, is by listening to the imam and focusing on every single ayah that he reads. And focusing on every single word that he reads. And not only every single word, but every single letter that comes out of the imam's mouth. So that every single letter that the imam reads, a person focuses on that, on that, on that letter. And he pays attention to every single letter of the Qur'an when the Imam recites it. When a person does this, there's no way that you know, his heart is going to be away from the Salah. That he's going to be distracted and he's going to start thinking about home or what he's going to do after the Salah or whatever. Because he's, he's in the zone and he's thinking about what is being read by the Imam. And there's many other words in the Qur'an that we all know the meaning to. We all know what Jannah means. We all know what Naar means, or Jahannam, or Malaika, or Kitab, for example. Or the names of, the names of Allah Azza wa Jal, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. How many times when we hear these words, do we actually think about these words? Do we actually think about the most merciful and the most gracious? Or when we hear the names of the Prophets of Allah, when we hear Adam alayhi salam, or as the Imam recited in, in Surah Al-Maghrib, Ibrahim alayhi salam, how many times when we hear the name Ibrahim alayhi salam in the salah, do we actually think about the story of Ibrahim, the prophet of Allah, the khalil of Allah, the friend of Allah azza wa jal? Or when we hear just the, the, the name of Musa alayhi salam? So my point is, brothers and sisters, that there's words in the Qur'an that we all know the meaning to. But it's just a matter of trying to focus in the salah and trying to understand and uh, you know, make that effort to, to focus on everything that the Imam says. And to make an effort in trying to understand and realize that there are some words in the Quran that we all know the meaning to. It's just a matter of listening to them and hearing them and then trying to ponder and reflect upon what we, what we know and what we hear and what we understand. And don't think that everybody who knows Arabic is someone you know, who is going to have khushu' in the salah. 
If that was the case, then all the masajid and all the Arabs would be, mashallah, coming to the masjid all the time and they'd be righteous people. But that's not the case. So it's not necessary that a person needs to understand the whole of the Arabic language in order for him to get some khushu and piety from the salah. Of course it helps. And it's better for a person to try to learn the Arabic language and try to understand as much of the Quran as he can. But don't think that just because you, just because you are going to learn more Arabic as a result of you learning Arabic that you are going to have more khushu in the salah. Because it's a matter of making the effort yourself and trying to understand the Qur'an. And if you're not understanding the Qur'an now with the words that you know and the words that you understand from the Qur'an, then how are you going to understand and try to have khushu and focus in the salah when you know a lot of the words of the Qur'an? So these are the seven that I mentioned in this hadith. سَبْعَةٌ يُظِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ظِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلُّ The seven that Allah Azza wa has given shade on the day that there will be no shade except his shade. The first, Imam Adil, a just ruler. The second, Shabu Nasha'a fi ibadatillah, a young man who is brought up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third, Rajulun, Qalbuhu Mu'allakun bil masajid, a man whose heart is attached to the masjid. The fourth, Rajulani, two men, Tahabani fillah, they love each other for the sake of Allah. Ijtama'a alayh, they meet for his sake, wa tafarraqa alayh. And they depart for his sake. The fifth, Rajrun da'atu imra'a man who is called by a woman to fornicate with her, that a mansib in wajamal, someone who has status and beauty. Faqala inni akhafullah, and he says, I fear Allah. And the sixth, Rajrun tasadaka bi sadaka, a man who gives sadaka, fa'akhfaha, and he hides it, hatta la ta'lamu until his left hand doesn't know what his right hand is giving. And the seventh and the last one, Rajrun dhakar Allah khaliyan, a person who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in isolation, on his own. فَفَاضَتْ عَيْنَاهُ And his eyes begin to shed tears. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us from one of those who will be in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day when there is no shade except his shade. أقول قول هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه هو الغفور الرحيم وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سلام الله خير. غربا غربا